So my name is Mark Thomas. I head up marketing and strategic alliances for RideSell. RideSell is a new mobility company that focuses on car sharing and ride sharing. I thought Roger's uh, parting remarks were very appropriate for this topic, uh, which is connectivity is really about enabling new mobility. For the last several years, probably four or five now, we've been here talking about telematics and how do we monetize the telematics? And I know initially it was thinking about the car as the next consumer electronics device. You don't charge subscriptions. You would do something more like put internet advertising. And so we were thinking along the lines of the car be, you know, as a cell phone. But what I think that people have come to acknowledge is that the car itself is what you monetize with your connectivity. When we take a look at where the growth is in the automotive industry, it's mobility services that are the growth engine. Let's take a look at the market capitalization that's expected for both auto OEMs and new mobility companies. So the gray boxes are auto OEMs. And if you look at it now, it's about a trillion dollar market cap for all of them rolled together. And by 2030, it'll be, you know, 1.4 trillion, so there's definitely some growth in the industry. But the green boxes are the ones that represent the new mobility services. These are the value of what these future service companies will be expected over the next 15 or so years. And that's where the growth is gonna come from the shareholder perspective. That's where the growth in the industry is gonna be driven from. And that's why we're seeing suddenly all the companies in the industry deciding, how do we get a piece of that? And it's not just this economic wealth that's being created where none existed. The green boxes, new mobility services, are actually roll-ups of multiple industries. Unlike thinking about the car and how do you sell additional things to the person who owns the car, this model is, how do you actually take all the different payments a person's making and consolidate them into one payment? Instead of having to pay for insurance yourself, pay to have your car washed, to have it maintained, to pay for repairs or collision, all that just gets taken care of when you get mobility as a service. The service provider provides all that for you. So instead of multiple payments by a consumer, it's just one payment to the service provider. And that's why this particular box, the green box, grows so much more than the automotive OEM business of just selling vehicles. Now, when you looked at Roger's slides and he talked about how automotive sales aren't really gonna be diminishing that much, it's true. But what you don't see is what this chart shows you. It's who's gonna be buying the cars that's gonna change the nature of the automotive industry. So in this case, the, the gray boxes are personal vehicle ownership the green part of the bars are cars that are sold into new mobility service providers. So somewhere between 2025 and 2030, in North America, in urban areas, more than half of the vehicles sold will be to these new mobility services and not to private individuals. So that definitely changes the nature of the economics. These companies will have huge buying power, certainly, different kinds of configuration vehicles will be required for these new mobility services. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's an important change. I live in San Francisco, and if you uh, would take that as a representative sample, it would seem like half the vehicles on the road are Uber and Lyft, like the new mobility explosion has already taken place. But the reality is, in uh, overall, about 1% of all passenger miles driven are in new mobility types of things, car sharing and ride sharing. So we are just at the very beginning. Uh, if you look forward through 2030, it's expected that about a third of all passenger miles will be via new mobility services. And it's you know, roughly 10% of those over time will be through driven. The real growth engine here comes from autonomous mobility as a services. And that's because when you take the cost of the driver out of the equation, it brings the cost down to almost below half of what it cost of 
and individual vehicle ownership. Some of the studies say that that's about 50, 60 cents a mile if you own your own car and you're responsible for every element of you know, maintaining, washing, and sharing. Uh, and that these autonomous mobility as a services that are uh, EV vehicles, so um, definitely cheaper to operate those, will get to about 25 cents a mile. And that's uh, absolutely a breakthrough. And if you wonder where all these market uh, capitalizations are coming from, this $9 trillion by 2030 for, for mobility as a service, it's the fact that it's expected to be a $1.5 trillion business. If you take a peek at where that geographically breaks out, you can see that Europe uh, and the US are certainly the lion's share over the next 10 years. China comes on very strong in 2030, in part because we think of new mobility services, these you know, robo-cabs or autonomous ride-hailing, as vehicle replacements. You know, I have a car, my wife has a car, Maybe we'll get rid of one of them and start using new mobility. But when vehicle transportation gets down to 25 cents a mile, we're also enabling an entirely new class of person to have access to vehicles. And as Roger showed in his slides, a lot of the, the new vehicle sales will be taking place in these developing countries. And so people that couldn't afford to buy a car can now take one for 25 cents a mile and take it from their home to the public transit that might be a mile and a half away. So we're really you thinking of it from our perspective as this is great, there's not gonna be, I'm not gonna have to worry about parking a car, but in other parts of the world, they're thinking, this is great, I'll finally have access to a private vehicle where I could never think about you know, buying one and making a, a car payment. So it's, it's fundamentally, you know, will transform not just our lives in the developed world, but in the developing world as well. So when we talk about how industries are stepping up to new mobility, it's those who stand to lose when private vehicle sales start to diminish, who are coming to us and who are having their heads of strategy say, hey, we really need to transform ourselves. And in the automotive industry, certainly the OEMs have gotten a lot of visibility for how they're changing. But the auto dealerships themselves are starting to wonder, are, are we the next corner video store? If people don't need to own the asset, what's our role in the value chain? And in the past, they've looked to the auto OEM as like, hey, we, they'll take care of us. And suddenly they realize, hey, these OEMs are going into business, getting their own customers, going straight to the consumer. They're cutting us out. So we've seen a lot of of the largest automotive OEMs coming in and realizing that, hey, this is both a threat, but it's an opportunity. Auto dealers, that is, have an inventory of vehicles they can use. They also have service bays. They know how to take care of their fleets. And so we expect to see a lot of dealers break into this new mobility area as well. Auto clubs. There's not necessarily much of a need for an auto club if people stop owning vehicles. And in fact, with cars becoming much more reliable and the primary value proposition of an auto club right now is still free towing services, uh, their, their customer base uh, is getting you know, one year older every year. At RideCell, we power Northern California's auto club, which had a, a realization that they needed to have a product offering relevant for millennials, and so they started a car, free floating car sharing service. Auto insurance companies also realize that if the number of accidents go down and the number of potential customers go down as more miles driven go to these mobility service providers, their business will be changing. So there's finally even related industries like rental agencies and even energy companies are having an initiative to understand how do they participate in this new mobility value chain. So our approach and recommendation to capitalizing on the mobility opportunity um, has uh, challenges some of the, I think, conventional thinking. 
when, you, when people are thinking about how do I get in and become relevant in this autonomous new mobility world, they think, well, there's been a progression from vehicle ownership to car sharing, which started maybe 10, 12 years ago, to ride sharing, which really became big about five years ago. Do they have to go through this progression, or do they have to compete with Uber and Lyft to get to what comes next? And if you think about that, this one bottom access are all vehicles that are driven. And in fact, the autonomous revolution is a different axis completely. And it's the intersection of this new mobility trend on the one hand and autonomous and self-driving cars on the other that enable autonomous mobility as a service. And in fact, when you think about autonomous mobility as a service, the difference between car sharing and ride sharing goes away. Once it's autonomous, there's no need to walk to the vehicle anymore. The vehicle just comes to you. So when we think about, well, what's the best way to get to this autonomous mobility as a service, the green box that has the $9 trillion market cap, is it, do I go into business and set up a ride-sharing business? And the reality is, no. Ride-sharing today, the core competency that the companies get is recruiting and retaining drivers. That is not a skill set that's going to be relevant when autonomous mobility comes into play. And in fact, car sharing, the owners own the fleet of vehicles. So when that check engine light comes on, there's no driver in it that goes, oh yeah, this is my car, I need to take it in for service. There has to be a ticket generated. The car has to be taken somewhere. There has to be a fleet operations center that knows how to maintain and service the vehicles. So this is a huge part of keeping a future autonomous fleet clean and on the road. And this is what car sharing companies today are going to learn that the ride sharing companies won't have any expertise in. Now grant you, there, there's nothing like pressing a button and having the car come to you. And so the ride sharing people have uh, an advantage in that it's easy to use. There's an installed customer base which they're thinking, they can monetize that and then just figure out the skills for how do they keep their cars on the road. From a car sharing perspective, one of the ways that one of our customers is approaching this is by having the car share vehicles valet delivered to the person. So you at least don't have to worry about walking to the car. It takes away that first bit of inconvenience. Finally, the ride sharing companies think of themselves as we are, we are paying a billion dollars or willing to invest a billion dollars of losses a year or more in order to become the monopoly. Well, one of the things we know is that switching costs are incredibly low. You know, I can just download the Lyft app and start using Lyft. I've had no, uh, in San Francisco, I, there, there's no loyalty program, something that I get points if I stick with Uber. So there's very easy switching costs from a consumer perspective. In in fact, the way we look at how mobility as a service is going to evolve is you take another business, which is transportation as a service, the airline industry. There's not one airline that owns a country. There are numerous airlines. And the fact, they offer different value propositions. There's those for entertainment, those for business travelers, that are those that are very inexpensive. And part of the way that these airlines do their business is by having alliances with other airlines, One World, Star Alliance, so that when I buy a ticket to come out and go to Berlin, for instance, I may fly United to Frankfurt, and then I'll hop on a Lufthansa flight. But it's still a United ticket. And as a, so United owns me as the customer, but they're able to serve more markets because they have these alliances and partnerships. We think that the future of new mobility will be a lot like the future of airline transportation you need to have alliances to be successful. So our recommendation for how companies get into the new mobility world with the aspiration of being relevant when autonomous vehicles are here, it's not to wait until their autonomous vehicle technology is ready. Because by then, the other companies will have built a customer base, they'll have built an infrastructure of uh, an ecosystem even around who services their fleets, how do they buy and sell the vehicles? So our advice is to get in as a car sharing company, which is either you know, residential, station-based, free-floating, uh, where people pay by the minute, 
and then extend this to taking their car sharing cars and renting them to Uber drivers and Lyft drivers. There's, there's currently a huge shortage of vehicles that qualify for these programs. 20% of all Uber drivers don't own a car that passes. Another 20% don't own a car at all but would love to drive. So if you as a car sharing provider can service this ride sharing market, that's a great opportunity to offer vehicles by the shift that include the appropriate insurance. We also think then that if your aspiration is to get into autonomous ride hailing, you have to add ride sharing and start to get expertise with taking vehicles that are in your fleet and using them for multiple purposes. So not just having them free float around the city where the peak demand times are during the day and renting them to car sharing, ride hailing drivers for other services, but start to get your feet wet and offer a value proposition. Certainly, this is the time then to, to build alliances with other car sharing providers. Even if a customer has your app and goes to a different city, it would make sense for them to be able to use your app to rent a car of a different person's service so that every city you go to doesn't require discovering who's the local provider, confirming that you have a valid driver's license, getting your credit card in the system, and getting, waiting for some sort of NFC card to come in the mail. But we believe that all of these are the steps that are necessary to get you into the autonomous ride hailing business. So the company I work for is called RideCell. We were founded in 2009 with the mission of providing new mobility. We're the only platform that powers both car sharing and ride sharing. Uh, we're based in Silicon Valley, and we power, for instance, uh, new mobility services for BMW. Uh, their, their version of DriveNow in North America is called ReachNow, and they're powered by us. We provide them with a car sharing platform, and they also take these same uh, BMW vehicles and put drivers in them and offer ride sharing with the same fleet of cars, which is one of the first companies to ever use one fleet for both car sharing and ride sharing. Uh, we power things for VW Skoda division, uh, auto clubs, and uh, 15 other companies. One of the things about this is that you can have a single app which lets your customers get both car sharing, ride sharing, and even rent a car, uh, one-stop shopping for your customer base. So this car sharing and ride sharing, there's actually many flavors of it. And in fact, uh, you know, there's station-based car sharing where the car lives at a station, the person rents it, takes it out, and then brings it back. A very common use case for that is that you reserve the car for a block of time. You know, I want to run some errands tomorrow, I'll reserve it from, you know, 2 to 5 in the afternoon. Free-floating car sharing is the kind that says, hey, anywhere within the city, it's like the car-to-go model or the drive-now model, you can pick up the car and then drop it off at a different area. It's unusual to have a platform provider that can do both kinds of car sharing. In addition, our company acquired a, an autonomous shuttle company. So again, our objective is to be the platform provider that takes you from today's car sharing into the future, which is autonomous ride hailing. Autonomous needs a number of different dimensions. Like if the ride hailing person comes up and there's a driver in it, they roll the window down and say, hey, are you Mark? Yeah, I'm Mark. OK, this is your ride. When it's autonomous, you actually have to walk up to the car and unlock it with your phone. They won't just let anybody in. So that's something that's really part of the car sharing model, where you'll walk up to a car in the street, unlock it with your phone. So the, the future autonomous ride hailing platform takes bits of both car sharing and ride sharing and packages them together into an autonomous ride hailing platform. And in fact, today, while we don't have this full autonomous ride hailing platform ready to go, we do have an important piece of that, which is an autonomous operations platform. And these are, the use case here is when an, Car makers are focused on teaching cars how to drive. What we do is we teach the car what to do if it breaks down. We teach the car how to maintain itself so that it understands if the check engine light comes on, all right, this is just windshield washer fluid. I can take my driver, my passenger to their destination, and then I can either call for someone to add more fluid, or if I'm near a service station, I can drive to it. There'll be a ticket that pops up and they'll know what to do when this driverless car pulls up 
and uh, is looking for help. If a car breaks down or if there's a stand storm that's coming and the vehicle needs to pull over, then our system will dispatch both a, a tow truck driver, who when the tow truck driver shows up, he has to have the ability to unlock the car, get in, put it in neutral, hook it all up, as well as dispatch a ride hailing service that will come pick up passengers if they happen to be in the car when it breaks down. So there's a lot of logistics to keeping these cars on the road, keeping them clean, keeping them maintained. And that's a you know, key piece of the autonomous platform that I think most people aren't even thinking about, certainly not talking about. So that's part of what RideSell does today. So our view is that the time to act is now. It's not to wait until autonomous vehicles are almost here. If you wait until then, you'll have a much harder time entering the business of new mobility. Don't wait, embrace partnerships, and uh, work with RideSell. We're the intelligent platform for new mobility services. Thank you.